I'm gonna talk about image guidance, and uh, this is always a slide I gotta talk about where I come from, and that was my dad. He was a neurosurgeon in Montana, and actually he was the uh, first neurosurgeon in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and both Dakotas back in the 40s, so that was a different era. Um, I don't have any disclosures. I guess my directorship at Cedar sinai is a conflict of interest in some respects. I'm paid for that job, so I guess I have to disclose it. And I do have some research work that we do with uh, operating room efficiency and workflow and uh, human mechanics and human performance is really what it is. We, we treat our operating room in some respects like a human performance laboratory. So I always ask the question, who has a smartphone? Who uses GPS? And the, the obvious question is everybody does, okay? I, I believe everybody does, uh, at least if uh, you're in the modern era. And uh, the, the answer to that is yes, we do. And so why don't you use guidance and, and basically a GPS in the human body when we operate? Um, we, we're really in a, a second generation. I started doing this back in 1997. I published first papers back then with some fellows uh, that are now actually at professorial level <clears throat> at a number of institutions around the country. But uh, you know, the question is, should we navigate things? Should we use computer guidance? And, and the answer is, you, know, you want your pilot okay, to use global positioning, and that's really what navigation is. It's global positioning, except it's in a very small, confined and, uh, and place. Uh, so I always ask these questions. I'm not gonna take a poll this time because I already know the answers to most of them. I think we do. Is it who uses it, who's used it, who would like to use it? Um, and would you like it to work better? And the answer for that is always yes. And you want your GPS and your phone to work better also, right? So it's, it's very simple analogies. What are some of the expanded applications? Uh, the expanded applications is just like Dr. Chapman said, I'm gonna give you a lecture today that has very little data uh, it has uh, uh, ends of, as in numerators, and ca cases of one, of a lot of cases, which are high performance cases. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna present a little bit of data about you know, what are some of the background and things like that. But I think I've given that in previous years. So what do we use navigation for and what can we expand it to? And I mean, I use it now in decompression surgery, not all, but many of them. When I'm doing a biopsy of something that it's inside of a, spinal column component, like the sacrum. What if somebody has a sacral lesion? Do you wanna go in there and try and figure it out anatomically where it is? You're kidding, no one's not gonna do that. We're gonna, we're gonna do an intraoperative scan or, or there's technology now that you can use some of the preoperative scanning and we're gonna navigate that. That's what we're gonna do. We wanna know where things are and we wanna make it real simple. What are some of the accuracies? We know the accuracies. I'm not gonna belabor these and show you data about them. But if you look at Different, uh, different surgeries with freehand um, application for hardware. Okay, these are hardware placement. Freehand accuracy, uh, it, it has its numbers and its revision rates, is that the, but using navigation puts you into the high 90s as far as your accuracy. Now, you have to be a good surgeon to do these things and you have to know how to do it without the navigation, but it really does help you in a lot of ways. And, I, and I'll show some little cases along the way and then some really complicated ones. But if you, if you look at the data, it, it really supports that there's a good place for it. Um, I talked a little bit about navigation workflow. I mean, you put more equipment in the operating room, it makes it more complicated. There's no doubt about it. Everybody knows that that's used computer guidance technology is that you have to orchestrate all of the people in the operating room. Uh, you don't just have a surgeon and a radiology tech and a scrub tech and, you know, and then there's an anesthesiologist. That's the way we used to do um, a lot of complex surgery. And, and we're talking about hardware placement. That's what most of these are about. But in the modern era, we've got the surgeon, we've got the navigation tech, we've got the radiology tech, we've got an anesthesiologist and a scrub tech, we got the implant techs, we got the nurse, we have all these people and we have to integrate them. And so this is like an assembly line. So when you go to General Motors or Toyota, you see these machines that are going by and they are functioning. They have to function well. If you don't get them coordinated, you're gonna have problems. So it, it, you have to be the leader of the team when you're in the operating room and you have to tell people. And that's why I tell people, let's just do it real simple. We'll do it my way. <laughs> Sometimes that has to happen, but you know what? I get the teams, everybody working in the same direction and, and that's what it is. What are some of the places that we use image guidance? I mean, basically use it in the entire spinal column, uh, use it in the skull when we do occipital fixation. 
Uh, I use it to find the keel in the skull in the posterior fossa when we're doing posterior hardware. Uh, we use it all the way down the spinal column, cervical, thoracic, use it in the lumbar spine for big, big stuff, small stuff, minimally invasive, and pelvic fixation. It's made it really simple procedures. Um, what are some of the anatomic things? This gets back to the anatomy. You got to know the anatomy. You got to understand each vertebral, each vertebral segment has its own particular anatomy, and you can you can look at it um, and scrutinize it in ways that may be to your advantage, or maybe you don't need to. I mean, some of them are generically used, and some of them you say, "I got to do this perfectly." That's another one of my quotes. It's really simple to work in the operating room with me. Just do it perfect. That was supposed to be funny too. So what are some of the things that we do? Here's a percutaneous uh, case that we do for trauma. I mean, these are things that sometimes we would put this patient with this kind of fracture in a, in a brace, but sometimes nowadays we operate on these. And this is someone, is it a young patient? Actually, we'll do these percutaneously in old patients that we don't want to open them up and we don't want to put them in a brace or we feel that the best way to treat this is that we can put an internal brace in the patients with hardware for fracture technology nowadays. Take the hardware out later if we want to. So this is all done percutaneously with a bunch of small incisions, kind of like laparoscopy is done in the belly. Um, what are the cases that you really need navigation? It's where you don't have anatomy. Back to the anatomy issue. If you look at the back of this, of this thoracic vertebra, which is previously operated on, how do you put a pedicle screw into this if you have to do a revision case? <clears throat> Now, you can do it with fluoroscopy. You can do laminotomies that take you a long, long time to figure out where the anatomy is inside of this patient, but you do a, CT, you do a scan and you can navigate this and you can make it look really simple, okay? It's really simple, just do it perfect, and this gives you a mechanism to do that. So this is like a revision case of a PJK case, and you can see that things have gone bad in this and you need new trajectories, and these are just simple ways to do it. We apply these, and there you go, there's what it looked like before and after. Uh, what about the accuracy of just simple, everyday things that we do for cervical fusions? Okay, I try not to do fusions, but if you're gonna do it, how many times has anybody ever had, <clears throat> had a case you have to redo and say, gee, I wish I had this kind of technology, okay? How would you like to have this picture? Because what are you looking at? You're looking at the back of the spine when you do hardware cases like this. But to have this available to you in your armamentarium, I mean, it just it makes you a better surgeon. Okay, it takes it doesn't make bad surgeons good surgeons. It's it, it but it makes great surgeons. Yeah, I think even better. Um, cervical spine. So there's a whole bunch of little caveats, and that's what these talks are about. This this is the spine masters program. We're not here to learn basics in 101. We're here to learn masters. Okay, that's what this is all about. So. Cervical spine is a challenging place. It's actually one of them that I, I think has got great applications. I use it tremendously. There's all kinds of things that we can do with um, um, making precision proce procedures happen with perfection. So we attach the reference frame to a Mayfield head holder. We've learned all kinds of ways to do this. Sometimes we'll use reference frames that are attached to the spine. Uh, we do that in other parts of the spinal column, but the cervical spine, it's problematic just to work in a very small area to put a clamp on a spinous process. Sometimes you need to. C2 is a place that maybe it's a special one, and this kind of illustrates that a little bit. But the reference frame, uh, on the Mayfield is something that you have to do some other tricks, you tape it down and you do some different ways. So what are some of the accuracy things? Accuracy, we talked about accuracy a little bit. This is actually a paper that I think we wrote back in the late 90s. I mean about C12, just the back to the anatomy, is that there was some paper that said 20% of patients have anatomy which you can't put transarticular screws in fact when we did transarticular screws and then we started doing pedicle screws and it's and I said no 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 let's do this and we're going to look at it with the image guidance this was late 90s this paper was published in 01 so we looked at it and it's less than 5% but in reality nowadays i think it's close to 0% because we just modify it with different ways and we can put screws in all kinds of different directions when we have to operate on C1 and C2 and do a fusion procedure so I told you, I'm not gonna tell you too much data, but it's, it's pretty evident that when you can see three-dimensionally, we don't have four dimensions here, but we have three, um, and we're, we're comparing it to fluoroscopy. I just don't think that there's really a comparison. Um, and, and for the safety of my patients, and, and just do it perfect, um, 
We have to use computer technology. It's available to us nowadays. These are some of the data points, but you know the accuracy rates are, are very high. Um, I want to show you more. There, here are some other applications. Okay, we don't just put hardware in, but this is where I will use the navigation to do the to do a fusion inside of the um, lateral masses between C1 and C2. We navigate that. We put the we put the guidance probe in, and we'll say, okay, here's where we are. Here's where we need to go, and it guides us in other parts of the operation. How about some complicated cases? I, I told you I'm going to show you a lot of snowflake or N of one cases. And so this is an unusual case that uh, patient has a congenital deformity with clipple file. Uh, it's actually a nurse who worked at a nearby teaching institution and uh, she was having a quadriparesis because of compression of her spinal cord which was down to three point some millimeters. She needed decompression, she needed a fusion. She also had a great big tumor in her posterior fossa which I didn't operate it on and I don't think she ever needs it operate or hopefully never needs it operated on but it's been there for years. So this is what the bony anatomy looked like. She needed a decompression, all right? So we use the navigation to do the decompression, okay? It makes that part safer. I mean, that makes ultimate sense. And then the reconstruction. I don't think that I've ever put a cervical screw into somebody's spine that long ever before, but she needed it because she had so few points of fixation. I don't put people in halos, but this is just one of those cases that we had to grab every point of fixation that we could. What's your, what are you gesturing there, Doc? <laughs> Professor Dubin say, I like that. It's like, you're thinking something's good? Positioning. Positioning? It's very difficult. That's difficult, you're right, it is. You're right. <laughs> I was looking at the body language. <laughs> This one made my blood pressure go low, but ended up, turn, it turned out very well. What about anterior cervical procedures? Another cervical spine is a mobile place. We use a Mayfield head holder, we turn it around, we put it on the patient simply as a place to mount the reference frame. So here's a patient supine. This is a common every, we don't do it every day, but we do it every week, we will do come some kind of anterior cervical operation that, that needs this. And so, We've made up other ways that we tape the frame down, we do everything we can to immobilize it because there's a lot of mobility. No matter how tight you think so, things are, you can shake things, you can move things, and you get a couple degrees of uh, error when you're, how far are we from the anterior cervical spine there? 15 centimeters away? There's a long distance. The longer you get, one or two degrees of, of, of error is a big problem. Okay. Now, you don't have to have it perfect, okay, because the surgeon has to still do the operation, okay? This thing doesn't do, do that. I got another case I wish I could show today. It's, it's a great case, but maybe Rod will find some place I could do it. But here's a cranial settling case. Here, here's an engineer from Boeing. He's not from here in Seattle. He, he's down in Los Angeles, Boeing. Um, he has a cranial settling problem, and he needed a transoral operation. So every, every part of this operation, to me, it was a navigated procedure. I have done these before. I, I was brought up, you know, doing transoral surgery in the early 90s. I did the first ones, and I had to do these anatomically and figure it out and use fluoro. But now you've got this technology that we can use this like a pointer. We can merge the MR and the CTs also, so we have both. But this just shows where the where we are during stages of the operation. This gives you pictures of the operation and then the navigation parts. So we can guide the navigation. We know exactly where we are. I don't have to figure it out. And the instruments that I use are navigated instruments. Okay, so we, we'd written a paper back, back in the late 90s also about how to adapt your instruments to the navigation uh, to, so you don't have just an expensive pointer. So what are some of the accuracy? I'll go back to the accuracy. They're all high. They're certainly better than I can do with fluoroscopy. Um, I won't go over the numbers of these, but they're, they're all incredibly impressive numbers. So here, here's a case study. Here's a post-traumatic case that's a couple years later that this fellow healed in a bad position. Not, not a good position, obviously. He had a lot of other medical problems. He had a, he had a uh, um, laryngeal cancer. He had a tracheostomy. He had all kinds of problems. And this guy was absolutely miserable because of his deformity. So we did a 
transoral operation on this guy, did osteotomies, took his facet joints out from, or his lateral mass joints out from the front side, did an odontoidectomy, had partial fusion of everything, and this is a 3D, what it looked like. In fact, we did a 3D model so we could show the patient what it was. And then we turned him over and we did a posterior operation. We did a decompression, took out the lateral mass, skeletonized the vertebral artery, and I put a, um, I put a lumbosacral uh, distractor in intraoperatively between the skull base and C1 and C2, and we ended up putting in a great big piece of bone. So these are some of the navigated parts of the procedure. So we just navigate every part of it. I know where I am with everything. I know where the vertebral artery is. I know where the spinal cord is. That's the easy part. But it's actually getting this thing back into position and being under the operating room table and repositioning them, and here's the transoral, and here's the posterior operation, and here's the hardware. And so we have a good reconstruction on this. There's actually a piece of bone that you can see that's a piece of ilium that I put into the guy's neck on the side that's in front of the, uh, in front of the hardware. And we did a short segment fixation. I mean, I, I'm a strong believer in very short segment fixation if you have big anterior column support. Why not? Why do you have to fuse multiple segments? I mean, if you got good solid fixation anywhere, cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, why do all these segments? If you've, got a, if you've got a big, huge anterior column, why do extra segments? So the same thing is true is that I, I've done these for a couple of decades where I do short segment fixation for craniovertebral junction, stop at C2, if at all possible, if you put pedicle screws in. Navigation helps with that. There he is. He isn't beautiful, he's better. So, okay, move, moving on. Here's data, I'm not gonna tell you much data, but thoracic pedicle screws, we wrote some papers about this. In fact, one of the first papers I wrote was, could you actually do thoracic pedicle screws back in about 1999? And the answer is yes, we could. We could, I had a fellow that had an extra fellow, he was mad about it, but it actually launched his career. Is that uh, I said, go to the lab, put thoracic pedicle screws in all these cadavers, and he wrote a paper about the learning curve is that he had errors like in 20% at the first one and 10% in the second one and about 5%. But we don't even, we don't even want 5% anymore. <coughs> what about other things we do? This is an everyday <coughs> practice, is, uh, but it's high performance stuff. Is it minimally invasive navigation in the lumbar spine? Is that we do it through tiny incisions? Is that we will do three level instrumentations, is we'll do an A-lift in a patient, two levels, four, five, five, one, we turn them over and we'll put pedicle screws in the back through two Wiltsy paramedian incisions that are about an inch and a half. Never see the spine. That's what I tell the patients. We're gonna do an operation, sounds big, we're gonna do it from the front, then we're gonna turn you over and do it in the back and I never see your spine. It's virtual. It's the truth, it's what it is. So that's what these things do. We it's, it's been a game changer for us. When you talk about disruptive technology, this to me is disruptive technology. It allows me to do things that I never did before, never even dreamed that I would be able to look inside of somebody, theoretically, and never see the spine and do operations on it. So some of the virtual things, these are the virtual guide wireless things that we do in the lumbar spine. I mean, this is pretty, I, this is becoming common everyday things that get people that are spinal navigation surgeons. Uh, what about deformity? How am I doing? Okay, I got six minutes. Why navigate deformity? These are the big high performance things that, that we do that are really complicated and, and they, they take a lot of work to make these things work right. Why do you use it? We want clarification, we want accuracy, but you have to make sure that you do things in certain sequences to happen to where it all happens. There's a lot of data. This is, um, All right, this is one of Dave Polly's papers. I mean, everybody knows Dave Polly. Dave's a top flight, high class guy. And, and we actually do some collaborative work with him, which is really exciting, and, and I think he's just a great guy. Um, but the accuracy, I mean, the, these are the same data is that if you look at it, it pushes these things into the high 90s for our accuracy rates. Um, we even have our own paper. We wrote about th small thoracic pedicle screws where we can't even cannulate the pedicles and we do in-out trajectories and we'll t do things like that with high accuracy rates. So here's just a case. I mean, they, these are, we've got many of these and as I said, this is uh, not an unusual case in our practice. Uh, it's a patient with an uh, adult 
idiopathic scoliosis and uh, she's worsening with uh, regard to her posture, her pain, her function. Um, and these are her numbers. Uh, these are some bending x-rays and the question, some of the questions are what should we do? Should need a T2 or T10 of the pelvis? That's one of my partners. He always says he only does two lumbosacral operations. It's either T10 of the pelvis or T2 to the pelvis. And so what do we consider about this lady? Her age, her body habitus, and, and all of these are considerations as to what we're going to do. And these are the specifics of the anatomy that we need to study. And this is uh, intraoperative x-rays of what we had reconstructed with this lady. And then down the road is that uh, that's day seven. And then we have this lady followed out for years. We follow everybody longitudinally. Uh, essentially indefinitely for people like this. We want to have we want to have follow up on them because it's not one year, it's not two years, it's not four years, it's what happens to this lady down the road. It's like Dave Skaggs and I were talking about patients that are operated on in their <clears throat> in their adolescence is that uh, we'll see them 30 years later, not me seeing them 30 years later, but they were operated on 30 years later. So the longitudinal understanding of these patients with these complex problems, really important. So these are the lateral sagittal views. So. Uh, pelvic fixation, this just goes to say is it, it has made this procedure easy using spinal navigation. Um, I didn't think they were difficult before, but this makes it even easier. It's like a video game. Um, these are just a collection of some few cases that uh, I think are interesting. So here's, here's a case I can tell how many years ago it was, 1999, because I know the fellows there, where they are now, one's at Stanford and one's in, I don't know where he is, somewhere in the Midwest. And so this is a, this is a patient who had a uh, thoracic disc herniation and a paraparesis and needed a front back operation. So we did it in a lateral position, went through the chest, and then we, we kept handing the, the navigation probe back and forth on either side so we could navigate it through the chest. And this was an open operation. Uh, I'd probably do that minimally invasive now or th with the endoscope, which I'll show you things. Here's just another case. Here's a, here's a patient who was a faculty member at, uh, in the dental school at UCLA, had a recurrent chordoma and operated on this fellow uh, three or four times in about a 10 year period until he finally succumbed to the disease and I would use a navigation system to go back and help me take the tumor out, show me where I was and what I was doing. So it was kind of an unusual case for that. What about thoracic discs? I do these with an endoscope. This is uh, uh, one of the fun parts of my practice. Uh, do we use navigation with this? Of course we do. We navigate uh, through the chest. Um, I don't do fusions of these patients. I do a posterior partial, a little small vertebrectomy right in front of the spinal canal and take these uh, big challenging things out through uh, small incisions. We put a reference frame on the back of the patient. Um, what about tumors in the chest with uh, with uh, navigation is that uh, here it is with, where we put a reference frame on the back of the patient, a lateral position. We put them on a, a Jackson table, carefully position them, and we can take a big tumor out of somebody's chest like this with an endoscope with a navigation. I'll keep going here. What about sacral? I mentioned a sacral tumor. This is where I would use it in case, use this in a number of cases. People come to us and say, we got this problem. What is this lesion? You know, sometimes they're a metastatic lesion. Uh, if the radiologist can't do something uh, uh, in the CT scanner, we can do this as a, a mini open procedure. Um, what about sacral tumors? Um, actually, some of my good friends and colleagues uh, that do a lot of um, uh, sacral chordomas, they've come to me and we've taught them how to do it and they don't invite me to the operating room anymore, but they take care of cases like this so we don't need to figure out anatomically where to do osteotomies and where things are so that we understand where that where that's happening. So here's a great case to end on, is that we use image guidance. Here's a patient had an, uh, had a distal sacral epidermoid tumor. Okay, an epidermoid tumor, it's this kind of chalky stuff. So this patient had a chronic infection from a little bit of residual epidermoid tumor. And this patient was sent to me, they'd had a couple of CSF leaks, they had all kinds of problems, been operated on six or eight times. And so they had, we had to figure out how to take out the, the rest of the tumor which had an infection because if you didn't clear it out, so what we did is we used a CT and did an MR merge where we could have this and we basically did a wash out of the infection and cured the guy after he'd, he'd had 
close to 10 operations over about a five year period in plastic surgery and everything else you can imagine. And finally we just figured it out and said, okay, we're gonna use a computer guidance system to figure out where this thing is because you couldn't find it when you're in the operating room. It says my time's up. <laughs> Okay, I'll end, I'll end there, but um, I think there's an application that you can use in, in almost everybody that needs a spine operation, and even if you want to do a, uh, a, a small operation, and, and I'll leave you with one kind of caveat, is that has, has anybody in the room that's a surgeon done an OPLL operation uh, in a patient with a, in the cervical spine and done a post-operative CT scan and found out that you had a big piece of bone that you didn't take out. Okay, so that, that's the one example, right? Kojo's back there, right? We've all done it. We've all had those cases. And it's how to, how to raise our game and how to elevate and use this technology. So thank you very much. It's been an honor being here.